right, folks. Todd Tremonti, Jason Simard, Brett Baker, we're back. And uh, as always, we're having conversations about our teams and your teams and your individual businesses and how we can grow as uh, company owners and business leaders. And uh, we're sharing it with you. So this week, we were all just kind of batting around the question before we, uh, before we started recording. Uh, where's the industry headed? It seems like everyone and their brother right now is talking about the future of the industry and everyone seems to think they've got a real clear idea of where it's headed. Let's see what, uh, let's see what conversation we can stir up today. So welcome fellas. Let's get into it. What's up? I'm actually pumped about it because it's, uh, it's kind of like seems to be the hot pot and everybody's worried and oh my God, where are things going? And you know, I have my unique perspective on it, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you both just have to say, too. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, you know, depending on when you're listening to this or watching this, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of we're about almost two-thirds of the way through 2018, and uh, there's a bunch of venture capital in the industry. There's a bunch of the old guard kind of holding on to what they've always had, and then there's obviously some up-and-comers. And then re really, I would say, and you guys can disagree if you want, it's always more interesting when you do, but the three of us um, run certainly very different businesses, but all our businesses that are below the radar of that conversation in the media, and that's right where I want to stay. You right. Know, I want to stay down here doing, doing business, creating something that matters, that's real in people's lives, and that generates an income and a life that I love to, to live. Um, so I'll, I'll comment from that perspective, but let's just bat it around the horn. And, and, uh, if you want to go, Brett, go for it. If yeah. not, I can lead us off because Jason just abandoned us again. It happens frequently. I think the, <laughs> uh, I think the truth is, I mean, you, you look at, you know, where we started, let's look at like the training programs that are out there. They're all about 10 years old. I mean, shoot, my dad's been doing real estate since 1970. I've been watching this since I was a kid. You know, I grew up kind of an outsider in the industry and I kind of forced my way in eventually. But you look at like the industry over the last 10 years. Yeah. Okay, great. We got the, we got the internet better. Okay. Our MLS is cool. Uh, now we, now every, the buyer's a little more informed. The sellers are more informed, but you look at it and everything's been the same for the past 10 to 15 years. They're still training the same stuff. My dad trained 15 years ago. It scares the heck out of me. Uh, and then I looked at like what we're doing and we just took what everybody else was doing and we just threw it out the window. Like if everybody else is like, we're buying these leads from here. Cool. We're going to throw that away. In fact, if you look at our website, dude, we went on our website and we went completely seller focused. You have to try to get to our IDEX. Like we are a hundred percent seller focused. So we went total media, total seller focus. And the response has been incredible. In fact, Something that is new. I love breaking news on this show. I just breaking left my news MLS. In Brent yeah. Baker. <laughs> I just left my MLS. Um, oh my we, gosh, that's like a dream. Uh, so we just left our, our local MLS. We went to a national statewide MLS, and um, I dropped the realtor tag. I tried to burn it years ago, but I haven't been fully able to shake it. We don't have I, to use it, but it's you know it is. I just I, it was one of those things that it was like wow. I'm not a national association of realtor anymore. Kind of weird, but at the same time, it's, we don't associate ourselves in the same way. We try to differentiate ourselves. Okay. Well, if we're going to differentiate ourselves, let's do it. Yeah. So that's my take on it. Yeah. So talk a little, I mean, I love what you're saying, but talk more about as an industry where things are headed and why you're doing that or what. So I think as a, I think as an industry, I think, I think, as the seller and the buyer become more, uh, I would want to say engaged in the, converse, in, in, in the conversation, they know more, they're better informed. We have to show more value as agents because if we don't, the industry is going to continue to decline. The people okay. that I see that are in the industry that are, that are doing the same old, same old, same old, all of a sudden are finding that their business is going elsewhere they're because of people like us like you, like Jason, that are showing the value because people aren't seeing the same value in real estate agents as they used to. Yeah. That's where I see the industry going. Either show your value or die. What are you thinking there, Jason? 
I, I actually, I kind of agree with that because at the end of the day, you know, people think, oh, well, the Uber effect, Uber has been a great thing for people that have it in their communities because, you know, it's easier, it's more accountable, it's a better system, right? But that, in order to work for Uber, you have to have a driver's license. Everybody and their dog has a driver's license. Um, as real estate professionals, if we don't do anything to elevate ourselves as actual professionals with high skills who bring a lot of value that can help you achieve your results and goals, then we're going to go down the way of the Uber. So what I think needs to happen is the bar needs to be raised for who can enter our business, who's going to become a realtor. Like it shouldn't just take two months or three months to become a realtor. Like it should be a process. There should be a lot better training. Um, I mean, there's so much, I mean, we're risk managers, we're business owners, we're coaches, we're, uh, psychologists. I mean, we do a lot in this business and it, to do it at a high level, you have to be good at multiple things and it requires a specific skill set, I believe. And so I think the people like, like Tom Brett mentioned is the people that are not adapting, who aren't providing value and that aren't trying to go above and beyond and elevate their skills will get crushed. The margins will likely get, continue to get squeezed for those people that aren't able to demonstrate value. And so in order to counteract that squeeze, you have to be able to be differentiated. For example, if I had to hire a lawyer, I would never hire my lawyer based on his cost. I would hire my lawyer based on his skills, his track record, and him being the best at what he does. Why? Because at the end of the day, that could help save me thousands of dollars or it could save me a, a criminal record. Who knows, right? Why you're being sued, but you definitely don't hire your attorney based on him being the cheapest. So why would you hire your agent on them being the cheapest? It's basically them telling you that they're not very conf conf uh, confident in their skills and in themselves that they have to discount their price in the absence right. of value. Uh, price is the biggest factor. Yeah. So, uh, I'm a filibuster here. I've got a lot of thoughts. So you guys can cut me off or raise a flag whenever, but I'm taking, by the way, I'm taking notes while these guys are talking. And if you're watching this and you're not picking up ideas, like we, we do these calls for two main reasons. And I'll, I'll be really honest. Uh, reason number one is we're each picking each other's brains to grow our own businesses. And then one a, it's really no less important to us because all of us love to share, but it's to share all this with you guys. And then, we're hopeful that you guys will come up with a great idea. I had two people reach out to me this week and say, Hey, I, you know, I saw you in a conversation on Facebook or I watched a video where you're in a conversation and I didn't want to share it publicly, but you, you've shared so much with me. I wanted to tell you about this thing I'm doing right now. I love that stuff, man. So we're going to keep giving, but we're also doing this to grow our businesses. So if you're not picking up nuggets and tweaking and changing and reconsidering things, you're, you're missing a big opportunity. And I, just because I'm here sharing doesn't mean I'm not learning and taking notes too. So anyway, uh, you know, when I started my coaching and consulting business, which we don't need to talk about, but I, I wrote this article or sort of blog or whatever you want to call it. And I was joking when I named it the commoditization of man. But basically what I was saying is like, look, if you're a real estate agent and you've become a commodity, or if you're a real estate agent and you're following the traditional path, which is trying to take a person and a service and make it a commodity, which should never be a thing. I believe God created us each with unique gifts and abilities. Therefore, there's no way we could be so similar that we have the exact same value, which is basically what a commodity is. Gold, silver, salt, sugar, you know, something that it's the same wherever you find it. And therefore, it's going to be valued universally the same. People and services should not even fit into that definition. But if you're allowing yourself to be pushed or you're pushing yourself into that definition, you are on the risk of getting wiped out. And I mean, very soon, right? So, you know, Jason talked about kind of the Uber factor. In our business right now, you're hearing a lot about, you know, Netflix killed Blockbuster, Uber killed taxis you know, orbits killed travel agents, but that's actually not true. Some of that is true, right? Blockbusters like got one last location in Alaska, I think, or something yep. like that, right? But the fact yeah. of the matter is there are still some taxis out there. Now, you know, Yellow Cab or these massive companies may be gone, but there's still high-end drivers for, you know, niche specific needs. We use a Disney travel expert to to build the perfect Disney trip. There's still travel experts in the niche specifics. 
My belief is that our industry is going to change a lot, but probably not as much as a lot of people think, because it's my core belief that when someone goes out to spend four or five, six hundred thousand dollars, maybe a million dollars, maybe it's just one hundred and fifty thousand, that that's a big enough purchase that there's always going to be a significant chunk of that population that wants to look somebody eyeball to eyeball, shake their hand and say, I think you actually care about me and my kids and my commute to work in the schools my kids are gonna to go to, and the safety of my wife when I leave town. And I don't wanna do all that on an app. Now, they might wanna do some parts of that on an app or on a website or with a robot or artificial intelligence or whatever. Um, I also think pointing back to some of the stuff Brett said, I'm not willing to let other companies own all of my marketing and lead generation. Now, sometimes stuff just works and you do it as a piece of your puzzle but if you don't own your content and your marketing and your messaging and to what Jason said, if you're not differentiated and that you offer some unique value, then you run the risk of waking up tomorrow or next month and your business is gone and nobody told you. Right? So just a couple of the notes I made, go ahead, you go ahead and then I'll share some of the notes based on what y'all were saying. Yeah. yeah. Let, you'll get lots of time here, but I want to just cut you off for a quick second to throw sure. something specific. Um, the Zillow effect. That's a thing in, in, in America, not really a thing in, in Canada. Like Zillow hasn't made it to Canada. Am I oblivious that they're going to try or at some point they're probably going to? It's, it's possible, very possible. Um, what do you think of the Zillow effect? Brett, I want to start with love you. What do you think? Love it. Why do you love, what, what is it about Zillow that you love? I think because so many people hate it, yet 97% <laughs> of all home buyers start there. And everybody goes, well, you know, you're feeding the machine, man. You know, you're, you're breeding the machine. It's like, yeah, you, you bet your ass I am. Because at the end of the day, I convert one in three. I convert one in three. It used to be one in four. We ran our numbers the other day. We're one in three. So if I spend, you know, I look at client acquisition cost, not cost per lead. So even if I'm spending, you know, $800 on a lead, I don't care if my, if my client acquisition cost is only, you know, 1200 bucks and I'm making 8,500 on that client, I'm still pocketing a good chunk of change and the leads just keep flowing through. As long as you have that, as long as you have that follow-up, you're good. And so I love the Zillow effect. I'm a big fan of it. Let's break um, that down for a quick sec, Brett. Yeah. So your cost, what's, what is your cost per client acquisition through Zillow, for example? I'm curious. Uh, right now we're paying about 350 bucks a lead through Zillow. And then after, after all is said and done, now here's how we track that. All, our team, all of our agents drive our team cars. So I can track how much our cars cost us a month. I can track how much gas goes into maintenance. I can track how much my client care coordinators will actually will, will work with them. I take their hour, hourly salary into all of that. I take all of my expenses into that equation per client. Okay, so what is so my cost, cost per client on Zillow right now is 850. 800 per client. Mm -hmm. Let's just run that through. Your, what is your average commission in your marketplace? 8,500 on, on what we're pulling in from Zillow. 8,500. Yeah. And if you were, so you were saying one in three. So in order yeah. to get a client, you're going to spend close to just under $2,700. Does that sound about Correct. right? Correct. So $2,700 to get an $8,500 commission. Correct. That's a pretty decent return on investment. It's a great now, return on investment. What you're not getting from that, and this is important for the audience to realize, is if you handle those three clients, those three leads or those four leads really, really well and leverage those relationships, you're going to get other clients. Nailed and this it. is where Todd is a master in this area and an area that Correct. I'm working on is the referrals. And yep. so and we've just started getting those. And people focus too much on the number like, oh, $2,700 to uh -huh. get a client to make yep. $8,500. I mean, I'm only making $4,000, but no, you're making a lot more than that because right. for every client that you get, if you leverage it properly, right. there's at least one or two potential uh, referrals that you're going to get. And the best thing that we actually taught our client care coordinators to ask is, are you going to be paying cash for this house? Or are you going to be selling a house or are you going to be financing? A lot of the times those people that are, that are in our move up price point, they're all selling a house anyways. So when someone says, oh, you're only making this much money on this client. Yeah. And then we list their house and we do a great job. And then we bust out our neighbors only open houses and we pull three or four more listings out of that. So that one client 
just generated four more. So yeah. we're Can you say something on that. Yeah. Yeah, I got there's like 76 things <laughs> I, I could say. On that. What, what I, I'll say a couple things real quick. We're not Zillow users. I don't think Zillow's evil. I don't think there's a, anything wrong with it. I don't. I don't want to fund it in my market with what I'm up against and some other things. That makes sense. You're in a bigger market. And I want to build things that can be insulated and, and targeted towards an ideal client. So there's some different values and focuses there. But listen, if, if you can generate a positive return through marketing, I don't blame anybody. And by all yeah. means, anybody who thinks like, like Zillow, Zillow's a bad guy is, doesn't understand capitalism. Now, you might say, I don't want to fund Zillow in my market, which is one, one of the things I would say. But saying that Zillow is doing something wrong, look, you know. Talk to Lee Iacocca about the automotive industry back in the, like, you know, Japan was a nobody in the automotive industry and then the United States taught them how, taught them how to do it and they kicked our tails in it, right? That's yeah. progress, okay? So the, it's up to you to not let somebody kick your tail. It's up to you to decide what value you wanna to bring to the marketplace. And a couple other things, I just, I think client acquisition cost is a great thing to, to pause for a second on. And I, I know Brett will agree with me, and I'm pretty sure Jason will. Your goal is not to minimize your short-term client acquisition cost, right? Now, you don't want to exaggerate it any more than you need to, but I look at it this way. What's the most I can spend to profitably acquire a client? Now, the reason I think that way, and I know a bunch of people just freaked out, right? But the reason I think that way is because I'm thinking about lifetime value, right? And, and Jason and Brett just talked about, it's not just the buyer, it might be a seller and a buyer. It's, just, it's not just the seller and the buyer, it's who they might refer me. And then I'll add, it's also the number of times they'll repeat and refer, and the referrals will repeat and refer over the next 47 years or however many years I wanna be in business or my team wants to be in business or whatever. And so ultimately those numbers are, basically incalculable, right? But what, yeah. we, what we know is that they sort of exponentially expand, right? Um, now you can, you can rationalize some really foolish behavior with that too, if you're not careful, like, hey, I'll pay Dave Ramsey a 900% referral fee for a lead and not a referral, but it'll lead to future business. Well, that's different. If it is literally net negative for you in the short term, that's not a good front end to repeat and referral business. But what Brett is saying is it's, three or four to one return and the compounding benefit of that yeah. future business, right? Now, if it's okay, I wanna revisit a couple of things we said earlier. Let's just say the future of the business is a national MLS and like Jason said, margins get squeezed down to 1% per transaction kind of stuff. I don't believe that's gonna happen, but those are things people are fearful of and those are things that people have encountered. I'll just say this. If, 90%, if 95% of our industry goes the route of um, national MLS, super slim margins, I will take a big chunk or a big enough chunk of that 5% remnant that wants high quality, world-class value, face-to-face, -face, shake hands, personal advocacy, world-class value and expertise, kind of like Jason was saying, like you would get at a CPA firm like you would get in a legal office, like you would get in a physician's office. The kinds of people that had to go take the LSAT or the MCAT, pass the bar exam, as opposed to the kind of person that needs to fog up a mirror and prove that they're alive and can pass third grade math and get a real estate license, right? So those, those things being said, I think the industry is headed towards definitely um, some innovation, definitely towards um, some creativity, definitely towards some technology shifts, but I believe in the value of relationship. And, you know, Jason mentioned that I'm obsessive about referrals. About 51% of our business year to date is referral. And then there's about three major marketing sources that generate the other 49%. And that's about the balance I want. 45 to 55. I don't mind if it sways heavy marketing or heavy referral, but I want it to be balanced. I think a hundred percent referral business is, is risky. And Very. I think a hundred percent marketing business is risky. So I'll shut up and let y'all talk but so, some thoughts about where we're headed and where I think we need to be headed as individual businesses. So I have a question for both of you. 
would you ever get onto an airplane that did not have a pilot up front? <laughs> Never. That's, That's a negative cool. ghost rider. Okay. Yeah. So, so a few years ago, the, the so background is aviation, remember? So uh, a few years ago, there was a thing that kind of went through what real estate agents are going through right now, where they're saying, everything's going to be automated. Everything's going to go away. We're not going to need real estate agents anymore. Same thing happened in the aviation industry about five years ago. And everybody went, oh, man, there's not going to be pilots anymore. Let me be very real with you. 500 feet after takeoff, autopilot's engaged. On most airplanes going into major airports, that has flown all the way to the ground by a computer. So you look at that and you go, okay, why do we need a pilot? Because no one in their right mind is going to get onto an airplane that doesn't have a pilot up front because people feel that that pilot is actually doing something because they are. Let's say the computer malfunctions, say there's a blackout in the, in the systems, that pilot's going to hand fly that airplane down to the ground. Sully was a prime example of that. If you look at, if you, if you look at that industry when they, everybody panicked for about a year, oh man, it's all going to be automated. There's still pilots sitting in the front seat of those airplanes. There always will be because it's a safety factor. I don't believe that real estate agents are ever going to go away because in an industry that is a person-to-person -person real estate or a person-to-person -person industry, you're never going to have that go away. People don't want to put hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of their investment money into an app. I mean, they will, some will. There's a lot of people that won't though. And like you're saying, that 5%, if they don't want that, people like you, people like me, people like Jason, we're going to capitalize on that. So. Yeah, and and I don't think it'll be 95% at all. Yeah. I'm just saying if it were that dramatic, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a huge Dallas Fort Worth right. license statewide, refer a lot to Houston, Austin, Waco. Right. Right. If it's 5%, that's a bunch of people. Right. I'll serve the ones that want expertise and that want world-class value and that want professionalism and that want advocacy, right. not just adequacy, right? Those right. are two significantly different words. But I, I want to I want to comment on the pilot metaphor because I like it. But what I want to do is I want to throw a softball into the strike zone and let you hit it out of the park. Yeah. But people aren't paying for the comfort of, of being naive and thinking, hey, there's a pilot up there. Because for a second, it sounded like you were saying, they're going to keep putting pilots up there because it makes people feel better. Then pretty quickly, you said, that's what Sully did, right? And right. I, I think that's a great movie. But in the movie, they show the simulators wouldn't have done it. All, the other, all the other you know, Monday morning quarterback pilots were like, well, you shouldn't have done it that way. When you're in the chair and the sweat beads are rolling and you got seconds yeah. to make a decision, hey, folks, you just lost your foundation repairs. Hey, folks, you just lost that house. Hey, you are going to be homeless, right? So in five seconds, just, just reiterate that the pilot does do something. They might only need to do something for nine seconds, but yeah. hundreds of people live or die, panic or don't because of that. Right. And value is not about time. The autopilot might be on for two hours and 26 minutes of a 30 minute flight, but I'm paying the pilot for takeoff and landing. Yep. Quick 10 second break to tell you about our sponsor, Real Geeks. Todd, Brett, and Jason all use Real Geeks as their website, home search, and prospecting database. Check it out at realgeeks.com. Now back to the show. I'm That's very true. Show. I'm going to move true. away from the pilot analogy because I think we can all agree that pilots bring a lot of value to what they do, just like realtors do. Real estate agents. Here's the thing, and I, I want to just like get really freaking passionate for a second here. If you are not a client-centric realtor, if you're not building a client-centric business that isn't all about the client experience and building world-class value. And what I mean by world-class value is exceeding your client's expectations at every level. And all you're focused on is you're saving as much money as you can, cutting as many corners as you can and making big commissions. You will not be in this business long-term. That's the way the future is going. So if you want to know why, we're being super successful because we are all about the client experience and we're not willing to nickel and dime our clients. Cause at the end of the day, the reason that I have a business today and the reason why I'm able to provide for my family and the people I surround myself with are is because we care about our clients and we built a business that's all about them. And the book that changed my life 
is the go-giver. It's the simplest philosophy, the easiest read you'll ever read. But you want to talk about a simple way to build a business? Give. Help others. Serve others. Do what's in their best interest at all times. And build a business that isn't about, look at me, I'm the top agent. I purposely don't wear a tie every day. I purposely don't have perfect hair because I don't want to come off as fake. I'm real. I'm myself. And people give me flack because I'm, I'm myself on social media. But at the end of the day, there is nothing that your client will respect more than somebody who genuinely cares and trusts that they can genuinely trust. So there's my rant for the moment. If you're not building a client centric business, you will be extinct. And that is how you will compete. And that's how you will win. And if you don't believe me, watch. I was looking on my bookshelf for you, Jason. I've got a, that's a great book. So is Go-Getter, by the way. And that's where the term Go-Getter comes from. Go-Getter's great. Go-Giver's awesome. I bought a book for everyone on our team called I Love Giving. You should definitely check that one out. But I think the point Jason's making is accurate. But I'm going to throw it back to Brett with this question or with this argument that I hear a lot. Brett, you can't have a business that's client focused and be so marketing focused. It's not true at all. We're we 100%. Yes, it is. No, no, no. It's all about you, Brett. All your marketing is about you and your pretty colors and your logo and your team. You don't care about clients. You can't do both. It's, it's funny because I do hear that a lot. I do get that a lot. Um, and and it, is, it is so funny. Uh, I had a great example of that. Uh, we had a, a person that was working with us, a client. She basically said, I'm in the process of getting my real estate license. I want to watch how you do things so that I can then do them. And I'm thinking to myself like, eh, do I really want to train competition? All right. Yeah, sure. What the heck? I took her listing. Um, and I basically involved her in every step. And as it came into it, a uh, low appraisal came in um, because we went like $25,000 over asking uh, when, when it was all said and done. We got a low appraisal on it and I went back and I ended up fighting it. Um, and it ended up coming in at value. Um, we closed, everything went perfect. And at the end of the transaction, she basically said to me, she goes, you know, I got into this. I wanted to learn from you how you do what you do. You treated me like a client the entire time. I've actually stopped taking my real estate license because I can't do what you do. I can't nice. give to people like you give. I can't do the marketing that you do. I don't have, I can't get the same level of service if I do this on my own. And I just kind of looked at her. I'm like, I mean, so you're not going to do your license at all? She goes, no, you're our lifetime agent. By the way, we buy about four of these a year and we flip them. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's pretty sweet. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's not all about us. It's not all about our marketing. At the end of the day, it's a, you know, you get to see the smile on the face of the family that just bought their first house. Yeah. It's the, the look on someone's face when they're relocating to Abu Dhabi and they basically hand you the keys on the second day you have the listing and say, have a great day, good luck. And yeah, you're expected I, I would, to do all that. I, I would say, you know, luckily we can, we've got a bunch of the same stories, you know, and the three of us yeah. really share that. You lead with value, right? Your right. marketing is a vehicle to expedite the process, to speed up the process, right. to scale up the process of building great relationships, okay? Yeah. And so, you know, these guys have both mentioned that they think of me as kind of the referral relationship guy, but in virtually every other circle I exist in, I'm the marketing guy, right? So yeah. it's just kind of funny to me. Um, but even though we do radio, even though we've done some TV, even though we do a ton of video and learned a lot of that from these two guys, even though we do a ton of internet pay-per-click, even though we do live events and all those things, it's all to get us into relationship, right? Correct. It's all to get us face to face, shoulder to shoulder, neck to neck. So we can go out and solve problems and create world-class value for families and build lifetime value. And, I, and when I'm training my team and obviously other agents and stuff that I coach and consult with, but primarily my team, we have this conversation about these are not contradictory ideas to have a, a phenomenal marketing campaign, great client processes, high profitability, and incredible client care and world-class value. They work parallel. They work together. They do not cross and contradict each other. The point is to attract the kinds of clients you can help the most and then help them at the deepest level. And if you can have marketing systems that allow that to happen while you're out serving the client, then you don't have to spend seven hours a day 
begging for business, you can serve the client at the highest level. Now that's right. also true for if you deliver world-class value to the client, they will tell people about you. So the best business building thing you can do is take great care of the client. So we're, I'm building a business so that more and more and more time, FaceTime can be spent with our team members and our clients. Marketing helps that and world-class value helps that. What doesn't help that is having to spend 11 hours a day prospecting and grinding. And so most coaches, most teams are saying, if you'll just prospect like a dog, you can build the biggest business you Correct. want. And they're right. That's just not the business I want. That's not the business my team members want. And by the way, it's not the business that our ideal client want us to have for right. all the reasons you just said. So I'll let Jason talk because I know he's chomping at the bit. So I, 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 yeah, you hit a nerve there. Um, <laughs> You're the uh, phone animal, man. <laughs> look, you, you know what? You, being proactive is one of the best things in any business. You want to make things happen, 10x your levels of activity and be proactive. However, there's a smarter way to be proactive. And if you can build brand recognition, you can build uh, a pipeline of people that have, are coming to you and you can get leads following up with or coming to you because you're putting out awesome content, you're marketing the right ideas, you're utilizing something that 92% of home buyers use, which is called the internet, to drive traffic to a website that can get you names and phone numbers. And then you get really good at approaching those from a value standpoint where you're in it to help them and you're genuine and you're the one that's going to be there three months, six months from now when they're still in their home search and you're providing value. That is how you win. And so I believe that instead of just, you know, calling FISBOs and expires, which absolutely works. I'm not saying it doesn't. Um, there are other ways you can build a very, very quick and successful business. And I've proven that I've never ever targeted FISBOs and I've never targeted expires in my business. And I'm in my third year and we're on pace to do over 300 transactions this year Did 125 our first year and 208 in our second year. So I think I do know a thing or two about how to do this and Contrary to what you might hear from, you know, some very reputable coaches who will absolutely help you be successful. There are other ways that might be a little absolutely. less grind in the long term if you actually can build solid foundation because there's only three things that'll make you money in this business. Number one is lead generation. You have to have consistent lead generation. Number two is a pipeline. You have to have a pipeline that you're consistently working on. And three is your skills. If you have those first three things right there, you can build a very, very big business. However, you skip any one of those three things, and I assure you, your business will lack. And that's how simple I like to keep it. And, and I, I, you know, I think one of the biggest things, if I'm ever coaching or consulting with someone privately, the biggest thing I ever work with them on is what is, how do they define success, right? So Jason was just talking about, listen, you can go hammer phones all day. You can call the phone book and be successful, right? If your definition of success is just to make money, right? right. But Brett doesn't want to just make money. Brett wants to ride his bike a bunch. Brett wants to fly his plane. Brett wants to go out in the boat. Jason doesn't want to just make money. He wants to spend time with his kids, right? And, and spend time with his wife and family and, and other pursuits. I don't want to just make money. I want to be involved with my family and my kids. I want to spend time in my garden and ministry and writing and all sorts of other stuff, right? So if you don't know what your definition of success is and you're in this business right now and you're panicked about where this business is going, you can go buy leads, melt your phone, never see friends, family, or anybody, and be successful if you've borrowed someone's definition of success, which means more units and more revenue. Now, that's still a very precarious situation around profitability, but yeah. there are people that are profitable under those models, and I'm not vilifying them. I'm just saying that's not my definition of success, and I know it's not you guys either. So, we said we would talk about the future of the business. We talked about the future and we've talked a lot about kind of our present based on where we see it going. Anybody have final thoughts on the crystal ball of the future or what somebody should be thinking in their business about the industry? Innovate or die. Okay, that's strong. It's simple. Nice. Innovate or die. I mean, you look at it. I mean, you build a better mousetrap. Get, get yourself... Think about your target client and where, I mean, you mentioned this in one of our episodes. I've actually run with this since then. 
you look at like your past clients and you go, Mary. Mary's a prime example. I want to do more business with people like Mary. What does Mary do? What does she work? What does she enjoy? What are her hobbies? Break that down. Find out your target client because once you find out that person that you love to work with, you're going to love working with more of them. And that's basically what we, we took the time over the last couple of weeks and we figured out as well. Who's our ideal client and why do we like working with them? And now when we get those clients in, it's so much fun to work with them. But yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, I was looking at your comment in the new book because I was thinking that's exactly yeah. what you commented about. But yeah, um, it's, it's not rocket science. It does take some implementation, but man, it is a game changer when you get there. All right, yeah. so innovate or die is, is Brett's comment. Jason, what do you think? Client-centric, baby. You, yeah. Your business, <laughs> you know what the points are with your clients, what the potential concerns they have about buying and selling, what are their fears and figure out how you can alleviate those and really elevate yourself as a trusted professional who they know is in their corner and will act in their best interest. You do that, you become invaluable and look, they're not going to phone the Redfin agent, no offense to the Redfin agent or the, whoever the discount brokerage is. I, we don't have Redfin in Canada. I'm just throwing it out there because I've heard it, but they're not going to necessarily call the discount and the cheapest person. They're going to hire you because you bring the most value and you'll get the best result. And that's ultimately what we're all about. So uh, just think about how you can elevate your game versus how can you reduce your services and offer the least amount of value to your client to make the most amount of money. Because if you're always focused on money, you're missing the point of this whole thing, which is really the clients. Yeah, I love it. I owned, a, I owned a flat fee franchise for five years, man. So I absolutely love getting that rebuttal, that contest. My, my, my one word, final thought, it would be relationships. Um, you know, we would be foolish to close this out without commenting. That recently, Gary Keller, the owner of the biggest brokerage on earth right now, if not one of them, depends on whose numbers you follow, but uh, jumped up at the Inman conference and had sort of a confrontational back and forth with Inman himself and basically said, the future is technology. If you don't own your technology, you're going to die. If you don't work with me, you know, you're crazy. And then he, he, he went on to spend, I don't know how much time, but 40, 50, 60, 70 minutes on that. And then at the very end of his presentation, or it was supposed to be a conversation, but anyway, at the very end, he said, Oh, and by the way, continue to build relationships with your clients because that's the most important thing. And I started dying laughing because I felt like he should have switched the allocated time to the topics. He should have spent 50, 60, 70 minutes on the value of the relationship and thrown in 27 seconds on technology. Now, listen, he's got billions of dollars invested in technology, and I'm not trying to say I'm smarter than Gary Keller. But for my personal final thoughts on where you should be thinking about the future of our business is don't do it with a glamour shot. Don't do it with cheesy realtoring. But if you build value-based, deep relationships with your clients, you're going to be just fine. All right? All right. We'll be back soon with another one of these. And uh, hopefully you guys are finding them value. Comment, like it, share it, subscribe. We'll talk to you soon. Over and out. All right, we...